welcome to another Fig Chat. Logan isn't here today. He's busy with um, some Greek study. He really wanted to be here, but um, we've got this great opportunity to talk to Dr. Andrew Corbett, and um, we need to go ahead with that because we really want to hear what, what he's got to say about F.W. Borum. Now, that name may not be known to many of you. It wasn't known to me until about four years ago when I, I stumbled across Borum. Um, but since then, I've written about Borum. I've spoken at conferences about Borum because he's been such a help to me. His, his writing especially has been such a, such a big help to me and been an encouragement to a lot of people. But, but Dr. Andrew Corbett is a, an expert on Borum, and, and we really want to hear what, what he's got to say. Getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, though. So first of all, uh, Andrew, would you be so good as to tell us a little bit about your family, where you're from, what you do? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, thank you, Jeff. I, I was uh, born in Geelong, Victoria, and and ministered in a few churches in and around Victoria as a, a youth pastor, then as an assistant pastor, and then as a senior pastor at pioneering a church in Melbourne. And then the Lord called us to Tasmania in 1995, and we've been here ever since. I'm into my 27th year of pastoring the church that I that I came to, but I, I didn't actually, I wasn't invited here. We didn't know anyone here. It was really a, a, a direction of God, and we came, and a week later, I was the senior pastor of a church of 17 members in a meeting in a, a an old war memorial hall, and since that time, God has been very good to us. We were in a, a town called Lagana, and if you're familiar with the shape of Tasmania, it kind of looks like a heart and, and where it comes down there, that's the Tamar River. And the Tamar River is a, the, the largest uh, tidal estuary in the Southern Hemisphere, which means fresh water flows in and out of it. And so a Lagana is where it becomes fresh water. That's the Aboriginal word. That's what it means. And so here we are. When we came here uh, 27 or so years ago, there was 1,500 people in the town, and uh, now there's there's a few more. But the church has gone through four building programs, and we we are quite blessed. We now have a 400 seat auditorium and and a staff of seven, and and so that that's a part of my ministry side of it. When when we came here, I was married to one wife and had two small children. I still have one wife. Uh, we have four children, uh, aged from 16, going uh, uh, three girls. Uh, my youngest is 16, and my oldest son, my son, is uh, 30. I'm a grandfather to one, or my, my wife and I are grand, uh, grandparents to one. And uh, we've married two off, and we've got two to go. So that's, that's, that's our family dynamic at the moment. My wife works uh, as a, a volunteer, in a, a theological distance education school. And uh, I serve in that school as well. I also serve as part of the, the faculty of Global Universities Graduate School of Theology. And so I'm supervising uh, masters and doctoral students, uh, both in Australia and in our Oceania region. Well, uh, sort of including Indonesia and, and strangely I'm, I'm on a a dissertation committee for someone in Nebraska as well. So, so uh, it's it's a it's a new world, Jeff. We've got yeah. you know we can we can be on Zoom talking like you're in the same room, and I'm able to help students in a similar way. So that's a part of uh, my background. And um, I, I, as you mentioned, F. W. Borum has has shaped my life and my ministry, and I'm always thrilled to be able to share what he's taught me. So, so how did you how did you get him interested in Borum? How did you come across him in the first place? Because he really has formed a big part of what you what mm. you do. And yeah, yeah. Well, behind me, not not by accident, but all of these books are written by Borum. So they're they're the they're the Borum books. And fortunately for me, the other books over here were actually Borum's own personal books mm. that his family uh, gave me, and they've also given me other memorabilia uh, of him just because they've, they've become, they, they became very aware of my, my deep appreciation for um, Dr. Borum and, and his ministry. I, I had heard um, some of the old timers talk about Borum and I'd seen 
some things on the internet where people were talking about his depth of uh, wordsmithing and as a Christian essayist. And, and then um, I, I, I just, I thought he was for old people. And so I didn't really pay too much attention to that. And then in my church was, um, or is still the daughter of a, a Methodist minister who had died. And she uh, asked me if I would like to come over and have a look at his personal library and, and take any, any books I wanted, which I, you know, Jeff, you and I would, would be pigs in mud, really, you know, an opportunity like that. And so I did, and I came, I came over and I selected um, uh, several that I thought were valid. And then I saw, actually, I saw this book here, which I'm grabbing. It's, it's, uh, and it intrigued me because it was, uh, I forgot to say, by F.W. Borum. And I thought, Borum, there's that name again. So I grabbed that. It actually sat on my shelf for months and months and months. And then one day I thought I'd, I'd just have a look at it. And my just have a look at it moment transpired into being, <laughs> being educated by Borum about the virtues of wet paint and uh, which is the opening chapter in this book and i thought where is he going and and i, I was just reading sitting at my desk and and reading he, strangely uh, uh, this i don't know if this shocks you or not but i had previously no interest in wet paint at all mm -hmm. and yet he caused me to be interested in it and i thought what is going on you know, what's he doing to me here and and then as i read through the what he was saying about wet paint it, it came right to the end where he talked about the virtues of wet paint. It freshens things up, but he talked about the, the first house that he and his wife moved into, a, a manse, and she said, oh, these colours will never do. And, and, and he said, painting, wet paint gives you ownership of something and, and it makes it yours and it makes it new and it makes it fresh. And, and, and then he talked about the problems with wet paint. He said he went for a walk around his a residential block and, and around the neighborhood and, and someone had painted their fence and fresh paint. And he, he just happened to brush his coat up against it and, and the wet paint marked his coat. And he thought, oh, it's, it's wet paint, the problem with wet paint. And then he realized that uh, his own house where he was now, that the paint that was once fresh was now hardened because it had been weathered and it could now withstand the weather and the wind and the elements and, and the beating sun. And, and it was like, he, he realized, yeah, wet paint is nice for a time, but you don't want it to stay wet. You want it to be dry and hard. So it's tough and it can handle all that life throws at it. And then he said in like a maneuver, he, he said, oh, the other day, just by the way, I, I had a young minister come to me and he said to me, Dr. Borum, the, the passion for the Lord, the passion for ministry has died down. I just, that new enthusiasm I had is just, just not there anymore. It's just, it's just, just not there. And he said, oh, sounds like the Lord's paint on your life has dried, son. And I got to, I got to tell you, Jeff, I sat there and I went, oh, he's just spoken to me. He's just, because it was about where I was at. And I thought, my goodness me. No one's ever done that to me. So I thought, I just, I read through that book. By the time I got through the end of this book, I felt like I was farewelling my grandfather that I'd never known. And I'd never known either of my grandfathers. And, and I thought, I've just met mine. And yeah. Problem is he died 70 years ago, but he speaks today. And so that then caused me to become interested in thinking, what else has he written? Well, I discovered he, he wrote 55 books. Uh, other uh, smaller booklets many of his essays were converted into smaller booklets he and uh, many of those uh, the tales of his time in New Zealand so I, I went over um, to New Zealand just to continue my my research and, and eventually made a, a five-part video documentary which is available online now and and uh, I just want to encourage people to consider Dr F.W. Borum and how even today, he can make a positive impact on your ministry because what he did when when he was a young pastor, Jeff, and this is, I think, our, our conversation four years ago or so when when he came into a, a small church just outside of Dunedin, Mosgill, 
uh, where the town itself was a thousand people. And I've just told you, I was in a town when I arrived of 1500, I thought, now I'd come from Melbourne, a city of 3 million people to a town of 1500. And, and here's D Dr. Borum has come from a, a city of uh, 10 million in London to a, a town of 1000 in, in the South Island. And, and I thought, man, we, 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 I can learn from this guy. What, what did he do? And, and what he did was he initially went around and visited those in the church. There was about 80 or so people in the church when he arrived. And he did that because that's what they told him to do in Bible college. He was um, a sponsored uh, student at a Charles Spurgeon's uh, pastor's college. He he went on to, well, he was one of the pallbearers at, at Spurgeon's funeral. And um, he he was sent by Spurgeon's son to New Zealand. And, he, and they just said, well, this is, they taught them to preach, but they didn't really do the pastoral side of things and he was told just go around and visit and say hello to people and drink a cup of tea with them that's all that that's that's pastoring and it was the this uh you know uh, the scottish immigrants of dundee uh dunedin and um who the ladies there just tore him apart and said don't don't come to us with your bible school training come come as a human being and listen to our stories and the moment they said stories jeff his eyes lit up because he loved stories and he, and he thought, that's right. All of these people have a story. And he made that his pastoral pursuit throughout the rest of his life. And Jeff, I've got to say that when I, when I saw him discover that, and he talks about that in his autobiography, I th it, it did something in me too. It's like, that's right. And as a pastor, part of our job for those we pastor is to enter into their story, to get their stories. And Many of Borum's books now are the stories of the people that he pastored in uh, Mosgiel. And it's, it's just, and he, it's so exciting. And you think, boy, these are people you'd walk past in the street and think nothing of them. But he opens up in his autobiography, which he wrote in 1939, just before World War II broke out. And he, he said, um, the, the, person's, the, the person who has a story that's not worth telling has never been born. Yeah, I think that's it's a wonderful pastoral approach, Jeff. So that's what got me interested in F.W. Born because it, it, it impacted my life in ministry. Yeah, I think I think that um, the story about the wet paint is such a, a fantastic introduction to Borum. You probably couldn't have started in a better place, right? Because uh -huh. we all know the old ad adage about um, the, the boredom of watching wet paint dry. And yet the, the skill of Borum is such that he can make the the activity of paint drying something uh -huh. not only fascinating, but but spiritually applicable mm. and i think that's mm. what's what's so exciting about him so um uh, you've already you've already picked up on a few things one one of the things that really excited me about borum was that he was he was in new zealand for a while mm. and and we sadly in this country don't have a, a, a big list of of epic um spiritual fathers and and heroes but hearing mm. that borum was just down the road from me in in moscow just near near dunedin um, that was really, could, could you fill in a few more of the, the blanks about his life and, and how he started? Mm. Yeah, uh, his, well, and, and this is, this is the, I guess, one of the things that caused me to grow in my, I'll say, my, not just my admiration, but my, my love for Borum, because he, he grew up in uh, Tunbridge Wells in the UK, in uh, uh, Kent, and so he, uh his his father was a, a law clerk uh you know i guess you you would say uh, uh upper middle class i suppose in to use the the british categorizing of people which we in australia new zealand sort of revolt against <laughs> but uh he his parents were devout anglicans and then there was a bit of a schism with some of the the liberalism that was happening in amongst the church of england and so there was um a, a move to become an, what's called a non-conformist church which they went to and so borum's church um as a church upbringing was was one where he was probably typically british in other words he, he went to church because he was english and he went there uh, without any you know without any realization of what this was all about at all in fact he 
he says that most of the time as a young boy when he was in church he was dreaming of being outside playing cricket <laughs> you know, so he so uh his he he says that at a young age he he realized that his parents marriage was in trouble and he saw the pastor of the church uh, it was called Emmanuel church coming around and helping his parents through their marriage difficulties and that's when this revolutionary thought dropped into his heart a young heart where he realized there actually is a practical side to Christianity it had never occurred to him he always thought it was just that's what you did on Sunday and the rest of the week is yours and Christianity's just well we've got to tick that box but now he saw this actually helped his parents the the, the preaching and the preacher helped save his parents marriage then there was another turning point in the young Borum's life where he stayed with his grandfather and he said he he happened to to come into a room where he saw his grandfather reading his bible and clear, clearly engaging with what he was reading and and for the and he, he re, again he realized he's not doing this on a sunday this is not because he's in church this is this is something that's a part of his life and again that jolted him as well because he's now seen these two two major uh, events someone who is um his, that, that he knew his parents and his grand grandfather and and so it it began to sow seeds into him that that god was more than just an idea or even a religious notion it was about you seeing a reality of life of, itself a reality to faith that yeah that's right a, 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 i guess we would call that a, a vivified or living faith it was something that was real to those to those people as, as they saw it he talks about growing up and, and going uh, sunday morning and then sunday night and he said he he his uh, parents ended up having a, a lot of kids and and so oftentimes the younger ones would stay at home with their mother on a sunday night but he and his father would would walk to church uh, as many anglican churches were within walking distance and and he said his father always chose to take a different route to church every time they went and he never walked without noticing nature he would point out the wildlife he would point out flowers he would point out things like this and talk about the marvels of god's creation and and things like this and all this sowed a lot of seed into to borum but even even though that was a part of what was shaping his young life he never actually made a personal commitment until he he was uh, schooled in a I guess a, a very small school where probably by about the age of 15 he would have in, in our language today matriculated you know probably take someone until 18 normally to to matriculate and he he matriculated around about the age of 15 and so that meant he could get a job and he got a job um, as a, a clerk in a brickworks uh, factory or a brickworks brickworks I suppose and one day at the age of 15 he was out uh tallying up the the uh they had a rail yard there and as the train was going out tallying up the uh the, ca the containers of uh, bricks that were were going out of their of their brickworks and it was a foggy morning he describes this as and the the uh rail steward who was there didn't realize that the young 15 year old born was standing in front of one of the dual points which is a big lead big push to to um move the train onto the right track and he didn't realize young Borum was there 15 year old uh frank was there and and he pushed this this lever and it, it simultaneously pushed into the back of uh uh frank and threw him under the train and he was dragged along for some 50 yards under the train with uh what looked pretty serious as the train backed up they realized that his his uh, lower right leg just below the knee had been severed and he was he was taken to the hospital and pretty crude medical treatment uh back in the the 1880s and uh that he developed septicemia uh where you know his body basically was was being riddled by infection and that that's a very minimal chance of survival 
in fact, uh, for about nine months or so, he was hospitalized, fever, infection riddled through his body. His mother received a telegram from the hospital saying, um, simply prepare for the worst. And so they were saying he's dying. And so she actually took that telegram and went down to their local church, uh, which as many of those churches were, I remember it as a lad, Anglican churches were always open. You could just go in and pray. And she did that. She went in and prayed and um, she just cried out to God and said, God, if you, if you preserve the life of my boy, I give him to you. Do whatever you want with him. Take him. He's yours. And she arose from that prayer and then received another telegram basically saying, something quite miraculous has just happened and he's turned and it looks like he's going to recover. And she knew God had heard her prayer. And it was a, a few years later after uh, he, he recuperated at home, he, he uh, ha had a prosthetic limb, which uh, curiously, Jeff, he, he never told people about, not even his own family, his own grandson never knew about it. Uh, and I, I spoke with his grandson about his recollections of his grandfather. And he said, I, I never knew. He walked with a limp. We all knew he walked with a limp. We all knew that he had, and I'll show you. Um, this was his walking stick. And he he walked with a walking stick all his life. And he had, he had a limp. And that's all people knew. They didn't realize that he had a prosthetic limb. But he... Uh, it, it, as soon as he walked out of his house to go back to work at the brickworks, he slipped on the icy pavement and, and broke his femur. And he would, he would go on to break, break that, his uh, leg four times uh, throughout his life. And uh, he ended up essentially having a, a pretty, pretty major physical and mental, emotional breakdown just around the time of world war one. But I'm just, Jumping ahead in the story, let, let me just say that he moved to London. They, he got an office job where he wasn't moving in and out. He got an office job in, in London at the age of uh, nearly 16. It was there that he heard street preaching. It was there that he saw people who were taking their faith to the streets of London, the London City Mission. And something he, he describes, he describes his, his conversion to Christ, not as a moment, but as, but as a, a journey. And he says, I, I can't tell you exactly when it happened, but I knew it happened. And so as a 17-year-old, he professed Christ as Lord and, he, and something had happened. He had also been mentored by uh, a Hebrew and Greek scholar. And so by the time he was 18 or so, he'd mastered biblical Hebrew and Greek, which annoys me greatly because... <laughs> took me i did four years of greek and i'm still struggling and and uh, uh I've, I've done hebrew as well and i'm thinking i think for the rest of my life i'm probably still going to struggle with that as well but uh he 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 nailed biblical greek and hebrew in his teens and then uh he himself volunteered to street preach with the london city mission and this was one of those turning points in his life when Charles Spurgeon came by and heard him and saw something in him. And, uh, you know, we often think of Spurgeon as the Prince of Preachers, but I also have come to realize Spurgeon was the, was the scout as well. He yeah, could yeah. scout um, preachers. I mean, he sent out 3,000 men that he trained as pastors to preach the gospel around the world. That's extraordinary. And, Boreham was the last one. Boreham was his last disciple. And uh, he offered him a scholarship into pastor's college. Boreham said that, you know, this meant essentially becoming a Baptist from becoming a nominal Anglican, I suppose. And, yeah. But he said he had, you know, coincidentally, he says, he had come to realize that uh, believer's baptism was probably more biblical than um, uh, what what he'd been taught baptism was. So that's a that's a part of his early journey. He went through pastors college. Part of pastors college is that they send you as a trainee pastor to take on a 
a, a struggling work. And so uh, he, 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 he was surrounded by other great ministers in London, like Archibald Brown would have been. That's right. Archibald G. Brown. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's, it's quite fascinating, Jeff, where he, um, you know, he, he marveled at these preachers. Uh, and, and so uh, there were, he said, like, he was so blessed to be in London at that time when, when the world's greatest preachers were there and he could yeah. take note of them. The interestingly moody would have been yeah yeah that's right yeah he he actually served moody tea you know he he <laughs> uh moody was in not not the green room but i think spurgeon's office after spurgeon died uh moody was there and and uh he as a student waited on him uh before moody went out to preach so yeah he had some interaction with moody saw and and bore him as the trainee pastor went to this small place state and boys north of london and that's where he met a girl in the church by the name of Stella. And you can tell by the way I'm saying that, that that's a significant moment because he felt it would be a lack of uh, ethics and credibility if he was to express his uh, interest in Stella because he had a, he was the trainee pastor and it just wouldn't have been right. But, but they did, they struck up a friendship and he kept it uh, uh, plutonic as much as he could pretend and then later on he proposed to her by mail on his way to new zealand yeah there's and a great there's a great story isn't there? i don't want you to tell it because what we want to do is push people towards the documentaries that you've <laughs> that you've made but there's a fantastic story about their romance isn't there and a piece of art oh, that he produces yeah, yeah. for a, for a church right. meeting um yeah. yeah it's definitely worth um it's definitely worth listening listening to that yeah so that's so so that all that's all part of it he was at Thaden boys uh, Spurgeon died and Thomas Spurgeon, who was the Baptist superintendent of New Zealand was called back to take on his father's work, but wasn't, he wasn't his dad, but uh, part of his mission in returning to uh, London was to, to he, he came with a request from the, the church at Mosgiel to send over a graduate, to send over someone. Well, well Spurgeon was, uh, sorry, Boreham was still, a year or two off graduating his four-year program he'd only done two years but they said to him you know what the, the rest of it is basically biblical languages and you've already got that and you're you're our top student and we we think you you know you're you're there already and so he was was asked to go to new zealand and uh his mother instantly reacted and said she didn't want to lose a boy and then she said the lord reminded her of a prayer if you give him to me uh, lord if you heal him he's yours and, and he was healed and and she had to she wrote to him and apologized and said i'm so sorry for my reaction and i just want you to know i i've asked god to save your life he has and I, i've told god that he can take you anywhere he wants and if it's if it's new zealand go with our blessing and so he went and did an amazing work in Mosgiel. Andrew, why don't we, um, I, I wonder if you'd be willing to do something similar again next week, if we were to finish the story next, next Friday, Happy whether to, you had yeah. another, sure. another half an hour then, and we'll, we'll pick up the story there, because um, me asking you to fill in the gaps, your passion for Borum's obviously <laughs> so, so great, <laughs> you, you, you want to tell the whole story, and we want to hear it as well. So maybe we could, maybe we could take a break there and come back next week, and we'll release this in a couple of parts. Um, mm -hmm and and that would be wonderful that way we get to rather than cut things short and and you're still cutting it short because you know there's things like his meeting with um uh, the china with hudson taylor right like there's a, mm, yeah. there's all of that that's in the documentary that people would would love to hear about and how he didn't end up going to the mission field why he ended up in new zealand and the journey to new zealand there's mm. there's all of that in the documentary so maybe andrew would you just tell people where they can find the documentaries now and then next week we'll yeah. come back and do so, a little bit yeah. more and finish yeah. off the story. The, the links are available on fwboreham.com, fwboreham, B-O-R-E-H-A-M.com. And you'll see the links there to be able to, I mean, it, you know, when, when we originally released the documentaries, they were a five-part DVD and uh, you can get those, but, but you can get them straight away in high definition, fully subtitled. Uh, by just clicking on the link and it, it's only a couple of dollars I think for each one it just yeah. helps run the cost of the website so uh, yeah fwwarm.com it's a bargain they're really well produced you've done a great job with them 
and they're they're fascinating they're really they're really worth the watch um thank you so much for your time and thank you for being willing to allow me to steal some more of it next week um we really look forward to that we'll make sure those links for the documentaries are also included in the video so that people can uh, can follow them um i'd really push people towards those documentaries because they're fantastic but we'll talk more about borum next week um and we'll be back sure. with with dr andrew no problem then. right thanks Jim. thanks so much for those of you at home who've been listening and thank you thank you dr corbett for your time it's great to see you again and uh, see you next week